They were the family that seemed to have it all. It's a robot! Every morning we'd wake up and, you know, we'd say we're the Conleys. We had the four-car garage. We had the pool. His business went gangbusters. He had tons of clients. And he was the kindest, most gentle man you'll ever meet in your life. Until a fire left their lives in ruins. It's what they refer to as a full alarm. Dispatch three engines and a ladder truck and an EMS unit. One day we're living the dream, and the next day we don't know what we're going to do. As authorities try to make sense of this tragedy, secrets soon emerge from the ashes. Having this illness, he's not able to work as much, can't provide for the family. They were close to the house going into foreclosure. It was very bleak for them. Was this the last act of a devoted and desperate father? Or a cold-blooded betrayal? I love my husband more than myself. Her affairs have been going on for a while. He caught her several times, once actually in the act of cheating on him. She would benefit highly if you have a fire that takes out the home and the husband. He told me he wanted to die. June 29th, 2007, Ringgold, Georgia. It's 9.34 a.m. in the quiet town along the Tennessee border when a proprietor of a local grocery store sees smoke rising from a nearby home. Gary Carlock owned his family store, Carlock's Grocery. He was the one that first saw the flames and the smoke and called it in. Seven miles away, firefighters with Engine 8 are starting their day when they get the call. It's what they refer to as a, a full alarm. Dispatch three engines and a ladder truck. I'm in an EMS unit. No relay, there's now flames visible. So you're trying to get your game plan, trying to think your way through it. Firefighters arrive at 9.42 a.m. to learn from command they can't contain this from the outside. They are going in. The fire looked like it was on the rear side of the home. We come in from the unburned side. So when we talk about the importance of priorities, you think you may be putting fire out, you may also be having a, a victim in there. We go through this first hallway, and we're immediately met with extreme heat and smoke conditions. The visibility was pretty low. We made it to the back bedroom. We'd realized that was the fire room for sure. We'd suppressed that fire back, and one of the guys with us, he was using a thermal imaging camera. The technology is capable of picking up a person's heat signature through smoke. As the fireman scans the room, an unsettling shape appears on the screen. He notified us that he did see what looked like to be a victim towards the back side of the bed. When we made it around to him, I remember he was kneeling by the bed in a sense, um, almost as if he, was a, if he was praying or something. He was unconscious, but he didn't appear to have thermal burns. He definitely had, you know, smoke on his clothes, on his skin. Usually victims are found very close to the door. They succumb where they just physically can't exert any more energy while they're trying to, to remove themselves from an environment. They preliminarily ID the victim as the homeowner, James Conley. Jim Conley was a local chiropractor who had a practice in Dalton, Georgia nearby. After my mom's arrest, we went to live with my dad's receptionist and her family. And we lived there for a few months. And like I said, I was a wild child. Um, and even after I lost my parents, I just, I hated the world, I hated people, I hated everything. Um, I was really rebellious, I was really mean, I was just angry. Um, so I was just hard to control. Um, and I've always kind of been bigger. Um, no one's ever really looked at me as a kid. I've always kind of been looked at as an adult, even when I was younger. Um, so that's kind of how I was treated. Most of my life, I grew up being really confused, <laughs> not understanding anything, mad at the world, mad at God, 
just mad at everything. You know, why this? Why did I have to lose everything? Um, why is my life not make sense? You know, why can't I get good grades in school? Why can't I be better at sports? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? When, when I had my dad, I was a star on every sports team. You know, I was on the honor roll in school. You know, I had all the friends. I had everything. And now I have no friends. I suck at sports. I'm failing all my classes. You know, so I'm just jumping at anything that makes any kind of sense to me. None of it I've really enjoyed. Only thing I was good at was working. So I started my own landscaping business, started cutting grass for people, and it growed. Um, until I joined, decided, to, decided to join the military at 17. Um, joined the National Guard through their split-ops program. Went to basic training between my junior and my senior year. When I lost my parents, all I was just an angry, rebellious, you know, just a rebellious kid that wasn't going to make something of myself, wasn't going to do anything. Um, and I wanted to change that. Um, and I just want to, like, we expect people to change, but we don't give them the circumstances to be able to change. Um, we really make it impossible for someone to turn our life around. We expect people to go to the doctors. We expect people to get put on medicine. We expect these people to do all this stuff. And then they do it, and it doesn't help anyone. Because it's not the people that's the, the problem. It's the situations that they're placed in. And I want to create a situation where people actually want to change, where people are inspired to do better in life, inspired to be better people, inspired to do better with their self. And just because of what I went through through my life and everything, after talking with people, and sharing, you know, the things that I've been through, the life that I've had, you know, they all tell me, Cubby, you're inspirational, Cubby, you, you know, you should use this to help other people. And through, I've lived, I lived homeless for almost three and a half, four years, some of it in a shelter, most of it bouncing from drug house to drug house, any place someone would let me sleep, um, even times under bridges, or just locking myself in the hospital just for a clean bed and a belly full of food. Um, but since I've got to Portland and I see the homeless community around me, um, and through my job at McDonald's, um, I've been able to work with the homeless people and I'm trying to partner with the shelters and just everything else to build something to give people a real chance to succeed in life. Because one thing I've learned through my struggles, I've been spending every day of my life trying to overcome what happened when I was 11 years old. Trying to run from it, trying to be more than that, trying to make something of my life. When I come into the, the polygraph exam, I introduce myself to them and uh, tell them that I'm there to administer the polygraph. Uh, I explain that I do not work for the Catoosa County Sheriff's Department uh, and that I am there to assist the investigators and to assist her with resolving this issue. I tell her at the onset there are three kinds of questions for the polygraph. Uh, there are some questions that I already obviously know the answer to. Are you sitting down? Are the lights on in this room? Those kind of things. Uh, that there are some uh, uh, very specific questions about the fire. Did you start the fire? Do you know who did? Uh, did you make any plans with anybody to start the fire? That kind of stuff. Uh, and I explained to her that probably the hardest questions for her is she the type of person that would start a fire for uh, profit or fraud or to harm somebody else. Uh, we talk uh, for a while about what brought her there and she tells me the story of uh, what happened a couple of days prior, the relationship with her husband, uh, packing up the car, leaving, getting notified and coming back. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we talk about polygraph in general. I explain to her how polygraph works. I identify each of the components of the polygraph, tell her what it measures. Um, after that, we go over the very specific questions that I'm gonna ask her. Before the polygraph, she knows exactly what the questions are, exactly the way they're going to be worded on the test. I know what her answers are going to be, no surprises. Uh, after that, we uh, um, administer the, the actual test. And the test, almost always, hers, consisted of a, uh, a familiarization test. I give her a little test where I ask her some questions that have absolutely nothing to do with the incident. Uh, and then, we do three 
small tests where I asked the same questions on each test. Um, and after that, we score the charts. Polygraph's kind of a, the scoring criteria is, is if you fail one question, you fail all the questions. Now, uh, there are different kinds of tests and different analysis. Uh, you can't always tell uh, which question she lied about the most. And in these two questions, did you start that fire? Did you plan with anybody to start this fire? If you fell one, you fell them all. And those were the two relevant questions on this test. And I tell her, you did just awful. And I show her the charts and I show her the computer analysis and tell her how badly she failed. And I said, there's only one reason you could fail. You started the fire. Um, she denies initially. She's, uh, she's nervous, obviously nervous. She cries a bit, and she genuinely cries a bit. You know, some folks, you're in there, then they, they feign crying, but she shed a tear or two. Uh, but she, uh, she was very conversant. She was doing her absolute best to explain away what happened and to explain her inconsistencies and explain why she failed the test. Uh, and that's what I asked her to do. Tell me why you failed this test. And I'll tell you, you failed the test because you lied about this question. And I tell her repeatedly, uh, absolutely positively, you started this fire. I said, I don't know that you dropped the match, but you had something to do with starting this fire. Uh, I said, absolutely certain of that. This is a polygraph tells me that that is a fact. You started the fire. Uh, now it doesn't tell me the hows and the whys and that kind of stuff, and that's what we want to know. And she was very talkative about what went on. I think most guilty people come in thinking, I can beat this test. I think Teresa was uh, uh, in a medical environment. She tells me she's got some medical training. Her husband was a chiropractor. She uh, is in that lifestyle. And I think she believes I can go in here and convince them I didn't do anything wrong. And I'll tell you, you can't. Um, but th I think that's what she thought. Teresa Connolly pled guilty to count two of the indictment. The indictment accused her of what we call malice murder. It also accused her of what we call felony murder. Uh, and the underlying felony for the felony murder was arson. Uh, so what she ended up pleading guilty to was felony murder uh, caused by arson or underlaid by arson. And so basically what she said in her plea of guilty was that she was involved in setting the fire that ultimately killed her husband. Uh, in a felony murder case, you don't have to have the intent to kill, you have to have the intent to commit the underlying felony, which in this case, again, was arson. So she ultimately was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, uh, which in Georgia at that time meant that she would serve a minimum of 30 years before she would be eligible for parole. In the judge's chambers that day when the plea agreement was signed, um, she was emotional but not, I felt like it was more of a emotion of relief that the whole thing was finally over versus remorse over what happened, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, there were a couple of tears and stuff, but I think it was more the finality of it all. I was relieved in a way because I did fear a malice murder conviction. I, feel, I feared that everything was going to poison Teresa, mainly from her own words. And so I was relieved that she had a shot of uh, getting out as an older person, but she would have a shot at getting out and perhaps restoring a relationship with her children. I had good memories with my dad before everything happened. Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm still processing it. <laughs> I feel like it's harder to process now as an adult as it ever was when I was a child. I guess it's because I have a better understanding now. Um, I don't know, as a child, I don't know if I ever really did deal with it. 
Um, I kind of just blocked it out and just didn't want to accept it, didn't want to accept my life was in the reality that it was in. Um, so as far as young, I don't think I ever did process. I just spent most of my life running from it. At the heart of this entire case is not potentially a criminal or somebody who died in a fire, but two children who had absolutely no say in the matter. And overnight, their lives were turned upside down. And no doubt, that day and the events that occurred that day and everything that followed after that has been life altering for them and is something that they will spend a lifetime trying to make sense of and trying to make meaning from. And it's difficult to try and make sense of something when it's senseless. And it's difficult to make meaning from something that has no meaning. For the first time since everything happened, me and my mom actually have a relationship now for about the last six months. We've been video chatting every weekend on the computer um, since I finally have the ability to be able to do that. And it's, we try not to talk about so much what happened as just who we were and what we were gonna become and the plans her and my dad had for my, my life. Um, it's more just focused on us getting to know each other and me knowing to get, you know, me learning who my dad was and getting to know him. Um, Cause that's something we've never had before. We've never got to know each other. We've never got to, I've never got to tell her my dreams in life. She's never got to tell me her dreams in life. You know, just who we were.